Hey folks, happy Tuesday. Hope you're doing well. Alrighty. Oh, look at that. I have the volume down a little too much. Alright. It is the last week of July. My goodness, I don't know where the summer has gone. This has just been, been one of those. Um, so appreciate you getting through it with me here. Um, hopefully it's, it's going about as well as could be expected for you folks um, if you if you need something let me know um, what i can do to help i know it's been a little rough uh, but we're getting there so we're in the home stretch we got tonight and next week and then just a, a short uh quick little talk on design patterns on august 10th and then on the 17th we're going to present our final projects our games and we should have a lot of fun playing them so i want to talk a little bit about the final project um, build that rubric out I like doing that kind of with you folks there to make sure everything that was said is getting translated into the rubric so we don't have anything that's confusing. Um, <clears throat> occasionally when I when I do it, it's not as clear because, you know, the, the what I think in my head doesn't always match what comes out or, or I make some assumptions. So I want to make sure that's clear. And then we'll talk more about JavaFX. We'll get some advanced controls, have some fun playing with some of those. I don't think we did a lot of layouts either. So we're going to talk about some layouts um, that we can look at as well. And then um, we'll come back and um, next week look more at graphics, effects, and media. So you can actually add like some images of dice and all sorts of fun things that you can do with those image manipulations. That's a lot of fun. Was everyone able to get their Java FX up and set up? I hope. Uh, I didn't. I saw a couple questions in Discord. We don't actually use the FX project, right? So we we start one. So that will add all the plugins for us, but then we don't use the project itself. We go back to a Java with Ant project and we add in all the other stuff ourselves. Oh, I should probably make my phone quiet here. All right, here we go. All right, and then um, I think one person it, I'm having trouble keeping all the classes straight here um, had said they're previous learning partner had actually dropped the course or they, they assumed they had dropped um, so if you're looking for a partner um, feel free to to reach out in the discord or we got the forums here in d2l um, you can try and find somebody if you're interested in, in finding a partner for the project uh, again I, I recommend you work in pairs uh, but you know I understand things are a little nuts with this remote learning so it's okay if you don't excuse me and no one has chatted yet. It's quiet today. You, you folks just like done with summer now? We're just mentally exhausted. I know and we're already talking about fall semester, which is crazy. All right, so let me close out this one here. Close our project. And then we had our project. I'm going to open up the first one here so we can look at all those examples that, that we have in there, all the comments and things, and we can go from there. So here's our Hello World GUI. I'm going to use that as the starting point when I build my new project, because remember we have to do a couple things every time. Oh yeah, there's a couple people in chat. Cool. All right. So I've got all the notes here in the original class. Bring our imports. We're going to need to add the libraries, set up the 
add modules in the run via options, and then add the module path here to the run tab. And then we have the start and the launch args. So I'm going to start with a new project. That's again Java with AMP. So we don't use FX aside from turning on the plugins because right? we get that error that, hey, I can't find it. No, that's okay. We're not using the standard build. So we'll call this one, let me make sure it's in 2151. Call this uh, GUI controls. Then we're going to add a bunch of things. So we're going to go to libraries first, and we're going to add library. We're going to add the OpenJFX 16 library. Great. We added the library. It's there. Then we can start um, adding in some of the other pieces here. So we're going to extend application, first, or we can copy in all these imports too. This might make that a little easier too. So we add all of our imports. Then we can say we extend the application. That should pick up the Java FX one. It should know that there. And now it's upset that it doesn't override that method yet. That's okay. We're going to get there with our start method. And inside of main, we're going to call launch, given the arts. Right, and then might as well, I'll, I'll copy in this, this comment here as well, because we're going to do it every time. And then we have more places we could copy from. Hey, Professor Perp, how you doing tonight? You were the first chatter. So thanks so much. And, you know, as much as I, I like being flexible and trying to do synchronous optional, asynchronous optional, I, I miss having people talk back. And like trying to have a conversation. Um, if if I were to just record something and have it like fully asynchronous, I'd be so bored here. <laughs> so I do appreciate you hanging out. We got to do a vibe check. Who's vibing? All right. So we did the libraries first. Now we're going to right click the project. I like that. The new animated emotes are cool. Gotta, gotta figure that out. I need a good one to like make it look like I'm drinking my coffee somehow. Like just make it tip. I don't know if the, the spin might be a little weird. So we're gonna right click the project, go to properties, go to the libraries run tab. We're gonna add that module path for our OpenJFX library. And then I forgot to copy paste. So I'm gonna copy this line here and we're gonna go to the run VM options. Oh, we got to be a partner to get this animation? Uh, that's never happened then. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so the run VM options to add modules, JavaFX controls and JavaFX FXML. Right? And then again, we're, we're all using 16. That's not a problem because unlike last semester, they didn't upgrade from version 15 to 16 and everyone had to re-download new stuff and they couldn't find the old downloads. So it's all good. We should be good on 16. And now the other thing we need is that to make sure that the name of this file matches here. So ours will probably be GUI controls.fxml. So I'm going to go to my package, and I want to add a new empty fxml. And if you don't have it in the list, just go to other and go to the Java FX section to find an empty fxml. Call it fx. Uh, so ours is GUI controls fxml. Great. And then we want a controller. Yes, use a controller. And uh, we're actually going to use cascading shots. Cas CSS tonight. We're going to use CSS. So yes, I want to add it this time here. So we get a GUI controls CSS, a GUI controls Java, and a GUI controls controller Java. So it generates a bunch of fun stuff for us here. It's all fantastic. And then again, if we've done everything right, I should have open and edit. So edit gives me the XML view, and open should launch Scene Builder for me. You know, I do actually wonder what, like, Twitch devs do now that they have the platform up and running. Because it seems like they, they haven't really done a whole lot lately to, to change or do, do much with Twitch. Um, I don't know. I, I'm sure, like, the reliability and, and just growing out the platform is important, too. But, like, what else do you do? I don't know. All right, so let's throw in... Um, so let's look at the containers first. So I think we skipped over that last week, right? I don't think we did a lot of containers. Does that ring any bells? 
We've got flow panes, grid panes, H boxes, V boxes for vertical boxes, and the border pane. The border pane's a lot of fun. But again, it just sort of depends on what you want your program to look like. So a, a grid might be fine, right? Depending on what we want to do, or I can just throw things on. Um, you know, you, you, you have options. So let's look at, what do we want to do? Let's add a border pane. Why not? I'm going to throw the border pane in here. And now the cool thing about the border pane is it has five regions. So the border pane has a top, it has a left, it has a center, it has a right, and it has a bottom. And you can put actually one item in each of those. Uh, but one of those items could be a container which holds other items. So uh, like if you're trying to drag in a bunch of things and then you have a button and then you want a label, it's going to be a little upset with you. Because now like the label's actually part of the button and it gets a little confusing. So that's definitely not ideal. We don't want the label in the button, right? So, so don't do that. So if you want to have multiple things, then maybe we'd use like a, a horizontal box, an H box. I can find my container. There we go. So I can take an H box and I can throw it on the top. Maybe I'll take an H box and throw it on the bottom. And then maybe for the left and right, I'll take V boxes. We'll go left and right for V boxes. Now I've got containers there to do whatever I want. And maybe I'll take a grid and put that in the middle. Maybe a grid would be fun in the center. And maybe we'll do it like a three by three. So now I have a three by three grid in the center. I have horizontal vertical box on the left and right. I have horizontal boxes on the top and bottom. It's just one way that you can organize these things. Right, and now I can start dragging and dropping lots of other controls in here, like my buttons and my labels and, and that sort of thing. So let's go through and build a, I don't know, maybe we can do like a little ordering system here as we look at a couple controls. So let's have... Um, so checkboxes are as many of these as you want can be checked for a checkbox. And we do things based on if it's checked or not. A radio button, when you group them together, means one and only one of those can be checked in the radio button list. So depending on what your options are, like if we wanted to sell bagels, we might have a checklist for do you want butter, do you want cream cheese, do you want, I don't know, what other things do you get put on bagels? Maybe you don't even do both. Maybe that's better for a radio button or plain, right? But if we were to sell a sandwich, right? And do you want lettuce? Do you want pickles? Do you want tomatoes? Do you want cucumbers? Like if we were to do like our little subway shop, um, we definitely want to be able to pick more than one of those options. But for a bagel, you either want butter or cream cheese. You probably don't do butter and cream cheese unless you're a savage. I don't know how you folks like your bagels. So let's do that. Let's let's figure out, can we add then an option for them to pick something? Butter and cream cheese? Are you, are you just means you're just messing with me or do you really do both? I can really go for a bagel right now. Okay. All right. You would, you would be upset with my radio button picks then, but that's okay. That's all right. So we're going to say, hey, what do you want to order? So we'll have a bunch of checkboxes here for things that we can order. So the first checkbox, we'll change the property. The second should be, we'll call this, uh, how about a, a bagel? And maybe we say that is a dollar. We'll just tell them kind of what it is here. So bagel for a dollar. Sure. Peanut butter on your waffles. Yeah, I do that. Definitely. Definitely do peanut, peanut butter and chocolate syrup on top of waffles. is amazing. Or just go right for the Nutella. Right, so you can order a bagel, and then if you select the bagel, we should give you some options now. So I'm going to add in some radio buttons then. So radio button, radio button, radio button. And this will be plain. This will be butter. And this will be cream cheese. Okay, so when you pick a bagel, we'll say, hey, do you want plain butter or cream cheese? And you can pick one of those. Now what we need to do is we need to add them to a group. So to make sure that one and only one can be picked, we need to add it to the toggle group. And we'll, let's say plain is probably the default option. So this will be bagel um, options. Sure. 
So the toggle group for this will be bagel options. So you can put as many radio buttons into a group as you want, and all of the ones that are grouped together then are going to belong together. So one and only one of those will be able to be picked. Okay, and then maybe over on the right hand side, let me take a label and maybe we throw this over on the right side. So maybe we don't have any text in it right now, but this will be where we're going to put the receipt. So I need to give it an ID so I can interact with it in code. It'll be the receipt label. And then over here, I need to make sure I give these IDs because I need to reference them in code. So this will be the bagel checkbox. This will be the um, bagel plain option. This will be the bagel butter option. And this will be the bagel cream cheese option. Uh, I think I misspelled that. Yep. Can't spell cheese. That, that's sort of small there. A little hard to see. Okay, and then I need, when I check the bagel box, I need to do something. So let's say bagel um, check box checked on action. Okay, well, that should be enough for now. So we'll save that and then we'll come back. Again, it should add all this stuff for us here. It should be amazing. It does all this FXML for us because that's why I love Scene Builder. Then we need to go right click and make controller. So if you're using a tool that's not NetBeans, I know I had some people who liked VS Code. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can go to uh, view the show samples controller skeleton and you can find the methods and all the attributes generated for you here along with all your imports that you're going to need. And you can copy paste them in yourself. But again, I'm, I'm a fan of doing less work than I need to, right? or you know, the efficient way. Okay, so and we, we haven't done any CSS yet. That's okay, we'll get there in a second. So we'll see if we can just get this to launch now. And we have our on action. There we go. So on action, we need to check and see. So we need to look for if the bagel checkbox dot is checked. Oh, dot checked. Bagel checkbox dot, on, where's my option? It's selected. Maybe it's just like, I thought it was checked. That's okay. All right, it is selected. Why not? If it's selected. So if it's checked, then it's been selected. Otherwise, if it's not selected, we still fire an event. We're going to do something. So if it was not selected, I'm going to take my receipt label, and we're going to set text to empty string. Because you unchecked it, you're not buying that. If it is checked, we're going to take our receipt label, and we're going to set the text to bagel, right, uh, for $1. And then we can also check here, or we could add to it if we want. We can say if the, uh, so I don't care about plain, right, because plain is, is no additional, but the butter and cheat cream cheese. So if the butter, bagel butter option is selected, Let's take this receipt label set text. You know what? Let's just do it this way then. Bagel with cream cheese. Cream cheese. Else if... Oh, here. We'll do the first one. So if the bagel plain option is selected, that's just plain bagel. Else if... The bagel butter option. Oh man, I can't spell anything. That's all right. Bagel butter option is selected. Bagel with cream cheese. Oh, no, that's butter. Else if the cream cheese option is selected. Bagel with cream cheese. So we can set the text. Again, lots of different ways of setting the text, but this, this is fine for now. I'm not too concerned. Just trying to see if we can get some of these working. And let's run it, see what we get. So oh, check bagel, now we get plain bagel. Uh-oh, it's not changing when I change these options. If I uncheck it, it works. Bagel with butter. Uh-oh, it's not big enough. All right, we're having a, a couple problems here. That's okay. So we need to resize our box here, make that a little bigger, which is nice. And then we want the same event handler, the same bagel checkbox checked. 
maybe we, we don't want to call it that. We, we can always change that later. But I want that same action to happen when we check these toggles. So if I change these toggles here, I want to re-trigger that event. So I can use the same event handler every time. So I didn't actually add anything to my code here. And NetBeans even thinks it's never used because it doesn't necessarily recognize the uh, FXML. And now each of these buttons is going to have an on action. This is the method name that we're going to call. Let's give it a shot. So I can change them. Nothing happens. I pick bagel. Now it changes them, right? Butter, plain, plain bagel. Cool. On and on and on. Does that make sense? How we're, we're kind of, excuse me, we're going to use that same event handler, that same response to an action for whatever one of these happens. The other thing we can do, which is fun, is we can hide these options when we uncheck bagel. So if we don't want them to be options all the time, we go to our controller and the initialize is kind of like the constructor. So initialize is setting all of these things up. It's essentially the constructor for us. We're going to say my bagel um, plain, no, bagel plain options. And there's a is visible property. Or, I'm sorry, um, set visible? Set visible to false. We're going to say, hey, don't show this one. Don't show it, don't show it, don't show it. For the plain, the butter, and the cream cheese. We'll say, hey, they are no longer visible. And then if it's selected, hey, let's make them visible. We'll set visible to true, set visible to true, set visible to true. And then, well, really, if it's not, um, set them all to false. All right, now I feel like I have the same code twice. Hmm. Well, we could call this method here, I guess. Or we just take all this out and we're going to make a new private helper method set bagel, I don't know, I'll check, show bagel receipt. I don't know, or check for bagel receipt. Yeah, how about check for bagel receipt? Do that, and then both of those can just call this method. Check for the bagel receipt. And we don't have to have the same code twice. Check for the bagel receipt. So when it starts, because the initialize, that's, that's essentially our constructor, it's going to hide them because bagel's not checked. If I check bagel, then it's going to say, oh, do you want plain butter or cream cheese? And then I can go through. If I uncheck it, boom, if I check it. So it's going to remember which one was last checked, but that's fine. We're not making new options every time. But then we can hide the options, essentially. Now, I prefer making hiding things here in Initialize. You can, in Scene Builder, go to the Properties and uncheck Visible. Um, where is it here? Visible. I don't recommend that because if you do it in Scene Builder, you don't see it in Scene Builder. And and then that's a little awkward. Um, so maybe that feels like a little bit more work, but I'd like to be able to see all the things in my UI here as we go. All right, so there's a bagel, and then let's do another one. Let's, uh, let's add another checkbox here. Or maybe we'll add a divider. How about we do that? Let's add a little separator here. Let's add a new option. So how about we do a checkbox for a sandwich. So we'll add a sandwich option, and then that sandwich option, and this will be my sandwich button. And on action, we'll call this, I don't know, sandwich button clicked for checkbox box checked sure and then we can add a bunch of options now under this one right you can have all sorts of different toppings and you can mix and match so we're going to add a bunch of other check boxes that belong to sandwich here so we'll do how about a meat option we'll do another meat option we'll do a cheese option or you know we don't need a ton of them so we'll do meat we'll do cheese and then maybe some veggies okay, we don't need to go too crazy here so let's say this one is just generic meat here and we should tell them how much the sandwich is, right? So the sandwich is, uh, how about $2 for a sandwich? 
And then oh, we got to make it a little wider. Looks like we're running out of space. So then meat will be, uh, how about plus a dollar to add meat? Then how about we do cheese? Uh, that's plus 50 cents. Right? And then how about our vegetables are free? Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Uh, cucumbers. Right, those are all free. Oh, I guess we don't need the dash there, right? We already have the plus. Cool, and we can do the same sort of thing here. So we just need to make sure they all have IDs because we're going to reference them in code. This is the sandwich meat checkbox. And a sandwich cheese checkbox. A sandwich tomatoes checkbox. and a sandwich cucumbers checkbox, right? You don't need me to do like all the options, right? That gets a little crazy. Okay, and then we're gonna, we want the same event handler to work for any and all sandwiches. Sandwich for meat, we'll do sandwich for the cheese checkbox, we'll do sandwich for the tomatoes checkbox, do sandwich for the cucumbers checkbox. Okay, so we all have the same event handler. Then we'll come back, make sure we save it, come back and make controller. So we go add all those new options here. And we have a new method, the sandwich checkbox checked. So we're going to do the similar idea. We're going to add a private method that will go and set the receipt. Right? So then we'll have a check for sandwich receipt. So, I don't know. The, the name there sounds awful, but that's okay. And also that means, yeah, make a, make, make a method for me, please. Go for it. Awesome. So we're going to do a similar thing here then. But I need to change all these other options here. So now it's my sandwich cheese checkbox, my sandwich cucumber checkbox, my sandwich meat checkbox, and my sandwich tomatoes checkbox. Set all those to false so we can't see them. And then we're looking for the sandwich checkbox. Sand oh, the sandwich button I called it? Okay, sure. If the sandwich button is selected, then we need to go set all these to true. So I'm just gonna grab these, put them in here, we'll set that to true, set that to true, set that to true, set that to true. And you know, I'm feeling a little bad about this too, because this is a little bit long here. So let's do this instead. Let me cut all this out here. I'm gonna add one more helper method here. So this is a private void. We're gonna say toggle, or I don't know, set sandwich, um options and we're going to say hey if you give me a boolean for uh, visible i'm going to go set them all here because now i can make my code even easier here right you can just set visible instead of doing all of those we can say set visible to false and then up here instead of doing all of that we can say set visible to true check that out isn't that fun Again, it doesn't save a whole lot here, but that's a little bit nicer, right? Because we had essentially the same code except for the argument. So if the argument's the only thing that's different, that's another reason we can use methods. Right? We love methods. Methods are fantastic. Oh, well, you know, I named this wrong. Set sandwich options. Let's refactor, rename. Right, use the tool. Don't do it by hand. Um, visible. So set sandwich options visible. Great. Now the problem is my receipt. I don't want to just set the receipt. Right? I can't just set the sandwich portion of it. Really, I have to go build this whole receipt. And building the receipt is going to depend on both of these, actually. Right? That, that's a little bit ugly to have to do all of that. So let's add some methods. Let's, let's see how we can kind of separate this out and divide and conquer. But... Um, when you check that box, we'll check for the sandwich receipt. So it's not a plain bagel. Now it's just my sandwich. And then we need to add some additional costs. So let's do that once in here. And then we'll go through and we'll add, clean that up a little bit here. So let's do this. Let's, let's fix the bagel receipt first. How about that? So when we do our bagel receipt, then instead of having that value here, we're going to make a string for the um, 
receipt. It's going to start off as an empty string. And then instead of setting the text directly, we're going to take my receipt. We're going to assign it to plain bagel. Otherwise, the receipt is bagel cream cheese, or the receipt is great. And then we don't need that one here. And then we can return the receipt. So I can use this method, right? It's going to give me the value here that I can add to the receipt. So we can have another private helper method. Uh, how about a build receipt? That takes the receipt. Um, it's going to start off as my check for bagel receipt. Right? Receipt. Uh, oh, it's not a void. This needs to be a string type. Sorry. So we need to return a string type. Right? We can return the receipt. We'll take that, and then we'll take my receipt. And we're going to add to it the result of my check for sandwich receipt. Um, and probably add in some new lines there too, right? Uh, how about our own new line? Backslash N plus. So check for sandwich receipt. Receipt needs to return a string. Now really, both of these now just need to build receipt instead of doing the, the original. So my event handlers then can just build receipt. Regardless of which one it is. So I'm not actually going to need a separate event handlers either. I'm going to take my receipt uh, label and we'll set text to the receipt. So we'll call the methods, check for the receipts, it will toggle my visibilities or not, and then it will show me my receipt here. Which is pretty cool. Alright, and then we gotta fix our sandwich receipt. So now this is not bagel, this was sandwich. If meat is selected, we're gonna say uh, receipt is empty. Receipt is sandwich with oh yeah. okay, so I guess we need to start building this all out too, don't we? We'll take, if we are build, getting a sandwich, my receipt will equal a sandwich. Hey, Josh, thanks for hopping on in. Um, Python's a great language for cybersecurity. Um, if, if you want to learn about programming, yeah. It's definitely a good start. I mean, no, no language is bad to learn, but I think you'll probably do more things in Python. All right, so we're either empty or we'll start as a sandwich. And then if we're having meat, we'll take our receipt and then we'll add to it with meat. And maybe we'll just add some, some spaces here or maybe we won't. All right, and then if my sandwich, the cheese option, and now these don't need to be else ifs, right? Because you can have multiple of them. So these are all just ifs, right? If you did meat, your sandwich with meat. If you did cheese, now you're also with cheese. Eat with cheese. With meat, with cheese. And then if, again, so not an else, it's just another if. My sandwich with cucumbers is selected. We'll take our receipt. You see our semicolon there. Receipt plus equals with cucumbers. And then if you checked tomatoes, sandwich tomatoes we'll say with tomatoes otherwise it's just empty sure no problem there and then we can return receipt if we did the same thing there right yep go for bagel yep we just set visible great let's give that a try All right, so let's check a bagel. Great, plain butter, cream cheese. That's working. Nothing, nothing wrong there. Let's do sandwich with meat, cheese, tomatoes, cucumber. Uh-oh. How about just tomatoes and cucumber? Hmm. And we're not getting the price here, so we need to figure out how we get the price as well. We're, get, we're getting pretty close here then. Right? 
adding in our item. So maybe we need even longer here, or maybe we need to add in our own new lines here. So how do we do our, our new lines with these? Okay, and then we also need price. Right, so we have a uh, double for price. Starts off at, at what, $2 we said? And then if we get meat, we're going to take price plus equals a dollar. If we get cheese, that's price plus equals 50 cents. And the vegetables were free. So at the end of all of that, and then we're going to take my receipt plus equals. And I will add a new line, right? Why not? And cost of, I don't know, plus price. So maybe add a dollar sign there. Ooh, we should do a nice string format here, shouldn't we? We should do a string.format. Let's give it uh, a new line and then cost. And then we want percent, what, 0.2D, I think. That, that format it nice. Uh, invalid format precision 2. Oh, no, not D. Uh, it's F for floating point numbers, right? Instead of... D is for digits, like integers. I, I hate these string formats. They're, they're always confusing. Anyway, let's see if that works now. So we, we can get a cost in here. So sandwich, $2. Great. And we add tomatoes, cucumbers. Those are free. We add the cheese. Now it's two fifty. We add the meat, three fifty. Tomatoes and cucumbers. Look at that. And a nice sandwich. If you add the bagel, we get a bagel too. It goes butter and cream cheese. Awesome. Or maybe we want the maybe we want the cost at the top. We can put the cost at the top. So instead of receipt plus equals, say sandwich. So let's do receipt equals this plus receipt. We'll flip it around here. So we won't start with sandwich. We'll add all the widths, and then we'll add to the beginning of that our sandwich. Let's see if that works. Right, add that at the beginning and then add the rest of the receipts. So sandwich, two dollars, meat, three dollars, cheese, three fifty, tomatoes, cucumbers, those are free. Right, my price changes. Again, just kind of changing up the order here. Makes it look a little bit prettier, right? Oh, we got too many new lines now. Okay, so we don't need the new line there. There we go. Let's clean that up. Sandwich, meat, cheese, tomatoes, got my bagel, great. Looking good so far. Cool. Now what we don't have is a way of a, like a grand total yet. And there's some ways to do that. Um, this is it's getting a little large here, but that's okay. We got lots of options for how we can tackle this. Um, trying to do the total individually right where our methods are returning strings not prices and we're like including that price into the string there's not really anything wrong with that that should be okay um not too big of a deal okay well let's go let's go do this first let's come back to our scene builder and let's set you know what um i'm gonna do it in the f in the xml because i don't want to have to change it lots of different places here so i'm gonna go to this on action don't think i can use the tool to refactor rename but what I can do is I can do a find and replace go to uh, edit you can do replace here or control H and replace bagel checkbox checked with how about uh, update receipt I'm gonna replace all the instances that we find of that so we're gonna replace all we're gonna do the same thing with the sandwich checkbox checked I'm gonna change that to update receipt oh I've lost the pound sign so it needs that pound sign there. My mistake. Oh, stop. And now it says, oh, I don't have a method. That's fine. We're going to go back to our controller. And we're going to change this to sandwich checkbox checked. Nope. Uh, update receipt. It'll be my method name here. And I don't need the other one here. Maybe just build the receipt out every time. So sometimes doing it like that can get it a little confused. Um... It's not the worst thing in the world to go change it in Scene Builder, but, um, you know, 
I'd rather not have to copy that and put it in all these different places here for all my different buttons, because all of my buttons are doing that update receipt, and that just feels a little silly. All right, so you can mix and match. You can edit the XML, you can edit the scene builder, whatever you prefer. It's totally up to you. All right, so now we need a way to get a grand total here, right? And the problem is our receipt methods don't give me prices. So we could split them out. We could do similar things for prices. Um, feels a little weird here. So what if instead we build another class, right? Because we are object oriented. Each one of these things is essentially a line item on a receipt. Oh, hydration. Thank you so much, Professor Burt. And I did find my floppy hat now, if anyone wants to redeem the, the hat reward. I, I stole it back from my daughter, although the bow is gone, so it's not quite as pretty. And I know some of you had missed the floppy hat from last semester, so I did find it. So instead of returning a string here, we can return another object. So let's write another class. This will be my uh, receipt item. And receipt item is going to be pretty boring and basic. It's going to have a private string for description and a private double for price or cost. How about cost? Right? And then we're going to let the tool do the rest of the work for us. We're going to insert constructor that takes a description and a cost. Great. We're going to insert some getters. And we can add the setters, but... Um, if you can set them via the constructor, we don't need separate setters, and I'm fine not using it. I'll be okay. So now instead of returning a string, I'm going to return a type of receipt item. So we'll have a receipt, and then we'll have a cost. So the cost for bagel is always a dollar. So I'm going to return a new receipt item here, given the receipt, and 1.0, cost. The sandwich receipt, and then we're going to return a new receipt item, given the receipt, and the cost, or price. We call ours price, right? So this needs to return instead of a string, this needs to be the receipt item. Okay. Now, oh, did I spell receipt wrong? I before E, except after C, unless it's some other weird things, sure. So now my string receipt is not check for bagel receipt. It's, here's a uh, receipt item, receipt item equals, now this is my bagel, right, bagel item, is that, and then I'm going to have another one of these for my sandwich item, okay, then my receipt will be the check for bagel receipt, or I'm sorry, the bagel item, bagel item dot get description plus that new line plus my sandwich item dot get description. Uh, so receipt will equal, a string receipt will equal that. I'm going to take my receipt, and I'm going to add to it then a new line, and we'll say total cost, plus we're going to add those two together, dot get cost, plus, so we should add our dollar sign, right, a sandwich item, dot get cost, get cost, get cost, and then I want to make sure I'm doing my order of operations, make sure those get added together first, not concatenated to the string, then we'll set the text. All right, so let's go through and check that. Oops, ouch. All right, so bagel, now total cost, uh-oh, $3. What happened there? Uh, so my receipt item for sandwich receipt. Ooh, price should start at 2 here. So price starts at 0 to start. And then if we get the sandwich, price changes to 2. Because we want to have 0 as the, the else option here. Try that. I can close that one down. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so bagel, a dollar, total cost a dollar. Oh, I didn't do the pretty formatting. Let's do the pretty formatting. Um, so this should be a string.format, string.format. 
I want total cost and then percent point two after a floating point number, comma, that stuff added together. Another parenthesis. And again, we should probably be using String Builder, but I'm not going to feel too bad about it here. It's not too much string concatenation. There you go. So plain bagels cost a dollar. Bagel on a sandwich cost three dollars. We add the meat, cost four dollars. Add cheese, four fifty. Tomatoes and cucumbers, great. And we see all of our items are updating. So I made a little menu. What do you think so far? You know, just kind of controlling it. Um, you know, using objects is, is fantastic for this sort of thing because now I can return more than one value. Remember, methods only return one thing. Well, if you need more than one thing, use an object that has attributes. Still not a large crowd. That's okay. That's all right. Oh, we're going to talk about the final project. I forgot. I'm getting myself all confused here, folks. Um, let's see. And don't forget the chapter 12 quiz. That'll be our last chapter quiz. Uh, that one's due tonight. So I need a couple more people to submit that one by 11.59 p.m., please. Uh, we only have 18 folks do the midterm. So I'm assuming we had 18 people still in the class. Um, All right, so for the final project, that's right, we wanted to talk about the rubric for that. So I'm bouncing around like crazy here. Let's go add a rubric. Right, and then um, I think someone had asked, I don't remember who was this class or the one of the other classes, um, if you would like to do this in a group of three... I'm open to that, but a group of three would have more work, uh, right? It, individually versus a pair. The pair gets some additional work off the bat just because they need to, um, you know, do that kind of coordination and collaboration, and uh, it's going to take them a little bit more time to work on that. So I, I usually do pairs and individuals to get the same project. But if you want a third person in your group or your team, um, we can add some additional requirements that you'll have to hit. Uh, I won't be able to add that to the rubric because that makes the scoring really weird. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. All right, so if, if you want to go down that route, let me know. All right, so for our Yahtzee game here, we got to add a rubric. I'm going to make a new rubric. This is for the final project. I don't need all these levels. Oh, no, I do need two levels, though, right? So missing is zero points, and complete uh, is going to be five points. So... Uh, actually, let's do, let's do uh, custom points here. So I want more than that. So this overall object-oriented design. So we're going to use classes to store the game state and actions in the UI to display that. So the idea is that the game is played in we write classes that have all of the game logic so that if you were having so much fun with Yahtzee that you wanted to build a web application out of Yahtzee, you could take your Yahtzee classes that have all these public methods like roll the dice or you know save scores or what any sort of options you want to have there, right? We can take the classes, just lift them out, and we'll put a different way for the user to interact with it, right? We can throw them into my web application, right? If you take the web systems development course, you can use Java or PHP. Uh, if we have Java classes, we can just build a way to use those Java classes, and then we throw a different UI on the front. We throw a web user interface on instead of a Java FX user interface. Or if you really miss the console-based applications that we've been doing all semester, or you did all 1500, we could interact with our Yahtzee classes through the console command line input. And the, hey, do you want to roll or keep the dice? Do you want to keep die number one? You keep die number two. Keep die number... Like, it would be really obnoxious with the command line interface, but you could do it. And the game logic itself doesn't change. Right? So the, the game classes there right, have all the public methods. So game classes, public methods, 
that are interacted with from the UI. So however the UI said, you know, hey, if you check this box, we should tell the Yahtzee dice not to roll them next time we click roll. Or when we click roll, maybe we tell it, hey, roll die one, roll die three, roll die five, or any sort of way you want to set that up. We've got lots of different options we can take, We, you know, to say, how do I want to set this to roll or set this one to save? Okay. Either is perfectly fine. So our overall object-oriented design, uh, that's going to be 10 out of the 40 overall points. So 25% is just designing it right and having classes here. Is that spelled right oriented? I think it's spell checked it. So just for having it designed right, even if it's not functional, you get 10, you get 25% of the project. So time spent designing is always going to be well worth it. Right? Think about the classes we're going to have. Think about how they're going to interact. Right? Because you don't want to have to have the um, the user player, and then we had it was against a computer, right? Or no, we weren't doing the computer. We were doing was it two users or was it a single user? We really should remember that. Hang on, let's uh, let's just open up D2L again. And I said, don't worry about the computer, right? Yeah, versus another player. So it's two individual players. So like this player will have a turn, and then this player will have a turn. We're not going to do the computer player. So but if you have all of the logic for one player, and it's all tied to your UI and tied to your buttons, you're going to have to copy-paste a whole bunch of code to do all that same logic and all the same things for the second set of buttons for player two, or however you're storing it. But if we have an object that represents a player with the player scores and all of its options and things like that. You just need another instance of player and you're done, right? It, it's going to hold all that. Sure. We're still going to need to connect the UI and say, Hey, update these labels. Sure. No problem. Right. We can add a little method that's like, Hey, go update my labels, right? Set them to visible or not, or, you know, set, set text on all these based on these scores. Go for it. Perfectly fine. Right. But if I don't have a player class that has that list of scores associated and is tracking their roles and that sort of thing, if I, if I don't have that concept, then it's going to be really hard to double it in the UI or say, hey, I'm bored and I want to play with six people. Right? Let's have six people play because no one gets bored watching other people roll dice. It's never boring. Um, Yahtzee's great for small groups. I, I never recommend Yahtzee for large groups. Um, people just check out. But, you know, that's okay. Or just get multiple sets of dice. That, that's another good option too. Everyone can just roll each of their turns. But that's okay. Right, so I have methods that will, you know, can go and connect those things. And there's other cool things we can look at, um, you know, a, a setting listeners and things we'll talk about next week as well. Um, all right, so 10 points just for your object-oriented design. Right, and then the uh, Yahtzee scoring the upper section. Right, that's just sum of dice of that number. Oh, great. Thanks, Android. Definitely. Object-oriented programming is the way to go. Um, so being able to score your upper dice. So when you score ones, it's the sum of all the ones that you have. When you score twos, it's the sum of all the twos that you have. So you get um, five points or ten points for scoring your upper section correctly. Including a bonus 35 if you get 63 or more. Total points for the section. Okay, so remember with the upper section, if you get three of each, so three ones, three twos, three threes, three fours, three fives, three sixes, right, the total there is 63. So that, that's the quick way to remember that. If you get 63 or more, you get a bonus 35 on your, your scorecard. Right, and again, just look back to the game. Right, we've got this little card game Yahtzee thing. So there's the bonus you can get. Right, sure. I guess we should move that one down, right? Because we should first tackle the rolling dice. Max of three rolls per turn is allowed. Dice can be held or rolled at each turn. So making sure the actual rolling functionality works um, and score before all three rolls have been used. 
So I've seen people like they force you to use three rolls and you're like, well, I don't need to. And then you have to go check hold on all of them and click roll, roll before it lights up the scorecard. Don't, don't bother with that. So you can score at any point of your three rolls. So make your first roll. You can score. You can take a second. You can take a third and you can hold and then you can unhold or you can like for the second roll, hold these ones for the third roll. You can not hold the ones that you were holding previously. So you need to be able to toggle them. I hope you're thinking like checkbox here, right? Uh, so we get five points for doing the rolling correctly there. All right, 25 points. Uh, let's do the lower section. So Yahtzee scoring lower section. Each item scores properly. Well, uh, 10 points there. Uh, and then don't worry about, about bonuses for multiple Yahtzees. Right. Usually you can get additional points and you, don't worry about that because that just makes it kind of confusing. So if they get a second Yahtzee, just, they have to score it somewhere else, somewhere regularly. Okay. And then we'll have um, is player versus another player. We'll say that's five points there. All right. So 10 points for object and design. Five points for the rolling, 10 points for scoring the top, 10 points for scoring the bottom, five points for making it player versus another player. So if you can only get single player going, you're only going to lose five points out of the 40. So it's not the worst thing in the world, but I mean, that's still a decent amount there. That's what, 12.5% of the project here is getting it to play another player. Okay. And then that overall score thing is worthless. Let's get those overall scores out of here. Overall score. I don't know why they make me do that. That's annoying. What are my options? I can hide the rubric? Why would I want to hide the rubric? That sounds horrible. What a, what a terrible, terrible option there. Yes, let's attach the rubric. Okay. All right. I, I'm well aware there are Yahtzee games out there. You, you can't just copy paste one of their Yahtzee games. If you want to look at like how they do some of their scoring, sure, go for it. Um, I'm fine with you like borrowing some code for scoring here, but you can't lift and shift the entire project. Okay? So uh, let, me, let me make that very explicit here. So you can cite um, sources for logic you copy for scoring. But it needs to be method by method that you're, you're citing your sources. Like, hey, I don't really know how I want to score a full house. How do I go figure that out? Well, sure, you go look up, see how someone did it here, look at what they're doing for scoring their full house, and you can borrow that approach if you cite your source. But that's how do I score the full house like as an individual method. Right. It's not, hey, here's a Yahtzee project I found, Eric, I'm going to copy paste the whole thing. Here you go. I cited my source. I, I shouldn't have to say that that's not cool, but um, just wanted to make sure that you didn't have that idea in your head, that you're just going to go find someone else's Yahtzee project and turn it in. Okay? And again, their their object-oriented approach may or may not be any good anyway. So, you know, they're at risk for a lot of points by stealing someone else's. Okay? That's unfair. Do you like that for the, the final project? Did that clarify some of that for you? Oh man, I got to turn my fan. It's getting warm in here again. All right. Well, I got a little after seven on the clock now. I think we're due for a break. Why don't we take 10 minutes? Uh, we'll come back, pick it back up, uh, talk more about layouts and controls. Definitely some hype there, Professor Perp. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, uh, we'll go from there. I'll see you folks in about 10 minutes or so. Let me put the music back on, and I'll see you soon.
Come on back. Alrighty. Cool. So we got a couple more controls to talk about. And then a little bit of cascading style sheets, because these are awesome. So <clears throat> the way that a cascading style sheet works is it allows you to style everything of a particular class all at once. Because we really obnoxious to have to go and change every one of these if I want to change something. So what I can do is I can say, hey, I want to change the label and set all the properties for all labels. So I can say, hey, my um, FX font, and these are not worth memorizing, just go look them up. We got, we got some examples. Um, you don't need to go find anything different here. So I'm gonna set the font family. Uh, let's use Comic, I think it's Comic Sans, like that. I, I'll have to go look and see. And then you do a semicolon, and we'll say FX font. We could set the size if we want, sure. Uh, let's say maybe we'll do uh, 14 point instead of the default. I'll see if they can give that a run. So what it's going to do, it's going to style all of my fonts here. Look at that. It works. Oh, I need to make this a little larger now then. So maybe maybe 14 was too big. Maybe we'll do 10. We can change the cascading style sheet, and then anything that's a label then gets this applied. Yeah, it's not Comic Sans that way. Uh, on, let me just go Google that real quick, because I've done it before. And I need to remember what it is. If you have a particular name. Sans. Uh, ah, Comic Sans MS. There we go. So we can set all of our labels that way. We give it a run. Let's do that again. Did that, did that apply? I don't think that applied. Hmm. Did that not do it? I don't think it did. Look, it even changed the font size, so it knew it was getting changed from the cascading style sheet. That's pretty cool. Oh, it's Comic Sans, MS. Comic Sans MS. Let me try the capitalization. Oh, uh, that's right. It's got to be in quotes. There we go. That's a, a string property, not just a regular property. Like 10 points doesn't need to be in quotes, but the font, I believe, does. No? Oh, goodness. It still didn't do it. Still didn't do it. Come on. Where is it here? I ought to have done it here. Why is it not working? Text font family. Ten point. All right, let me just go Google. I thought I had that working. Java FX, SS, Comic Sans. Maybe that'll give us a hit. No, that wasn't useful. Uh, no. Oh, here's a tic-tac-toe game. Look at that. Yeah, Comic Sans Us. 
Hmm. That looks like that should have done it. Let's see, can we set it for everything instead of just our labels, maybe? Sorry, folks, I really thought that worked last time. Fused now. There, okay. So, is it not label? Then? That's weird. Oh, these aren't labels, friends. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm dumb. So, these are not labels. These are checkboxes and radio buttons. That's why I wasn't applying the font. My goodness. Um, where do we see that? You show the CSS analyzer. So this is really cool. If you click the CSS analyzer, it's going to show us where we're getting our properties from. It's pretty cool. I don't think we're using any of these ones though. Here we go. Font family. Why does it say? It shouldn't say system. Didn't it get the style sheet? It showed it here. All right. Ours is not working very well. That's all right. I was hoping it would show us. That's really weird. It's not. All right. Anyway, so the cascading style sheets, you can set all sorts of properties there, just like you would do when you do web. And then if it applies, it will style it for you. And it will cascade down. So if we put it at our class level, everything in the class gets it. If we want to make it just buttons or checkboxes, we can make it just buttons or checkboxes or labels or any sort of option we want here. So we could say like dot radio button, radio button. And we could apply this just to radio buttons if we wanted. Let me restart that so my checkboxes won't be affected, just the radio buttons would be. All right, so plain butter and cream cheese. But not, oh, did that not even apply? Did it miss it? Oh, goodness. Might even miss that. But you can apply it at different levels. That's, that's the general idea with the cascading style sheet. We're not going to spend too much time, but they are a lot of fun. So if you want to apply something quickly, um, you know, in, all the way across, uh, it's a quick way for you. So all the different type selectors have options that you can set the properties for. Um, just go look it up. The book has a pretty good um, reference there. Or there's also a website here on the CSS reference guide. So again, this is linked out from the book here. So you can look at different, whatever things you want and see all the different CSS properties you can do here. So for a text area, right, you can add certain options here. Right, and as a text input control. So you have a lot of cool options you can do. Come on, window. Ooh. There we go. All right. And then style sheets, sure. Yep, 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 yep. New colors. Oh, new all sorts of fun stuff with it. So we're not going to spend as much time as the book does talking about style sheets. And we did radio buttons. We did checkboxes. Great. Um, a list view is fun. You can select items from a list of values. So let's come back to our scene builder here. Um, and then it also gives you a little bit of scrolling. So let's look at our control. So a list view. Drag and drop one of these in. I don't know, maybe here in the bottom. I don't know. So with our list view, they're able to pick more than one option from the list view. And what we want to do is let's give it an ID here, and then we're going to go give it the option. So this is my list view. Sure. Um, maybe we'll call this the coffee list view. Because I could use some coffee right about now. 
Uh, yeah, overwrite. That's all good. Okay, and then we'll come back to our FXML. We'll make controller. And then we need, when something is done on this list view, so we need a um, edit. No, we don't want any, any of the edits. We don't want the drag and drops. Um, we don't want rotations. We don't want swipes. We don't need touch. We don't need zoom. Which one is it going to be here on? Mouse press. How about on mouse press? Let's do uh, list view update. We'll call a list view update method when we click the mouse. So our controller should have that new method then. Here's our list view update. And let's just grab another label here. Throw that in as well. And then we'll say this is our list view label. All right, and then we can get rid of its text to start. Doesn't need to have any starting text. Now we're going to come to our list view. So when we initialize, this is where we're going to set our options here. So we're going to take our list view. And we need to get its, uh, what is it in here? It's items. I think it's get items. Yep, get items. And then we're going to add. And we just want to add all. So we're going to add a bunch of items here. So let's say uh, black coffee. Let's add cold brew coffee. Let's add. Oops. Let's add espresso. Let's add Americano. Not sure. We'll just add a couple coffee types here. Oh, goodness. Oh, thank you, Dusty. I'm slouching again here. Let me grab my little board here. Thank you. And hydration. Yeah. I'm almost out of my Coke here. but There. Thank you. So my list view is a little confused because I didn't tell it's a type of string. So we need to say it's a type of string here. So instead of question mark, we want type of string, and then I can add strings to it. So when I initialize, I'm going to add all the items to it. Oh, friend. I did it wrong. Uh, what happened here? So I'm finding these errors is obnoxious. Oh, on action, update receipt. Then handler's not in the namespace, so there's an error in the script. Oh, goodness. Update receipt. Is it right there? Did we do something wrong with our FXML? We probably did. Let's update receipt. No, that's fine. That's all there. I can't find... Does it not build? Maybe I have a problem on building. No, no errors there. All right, now I'm confused. Update receipt. We'll build the receipt. Build the receipt does that. What did we do wrong? Just for fun, let me try it one more time. It's probably in the crown. Yep. Oh, goodness. There's an error in the script or update receipt. I think someone must not be compiling right. Can we build it? Oh yeah, I've got two, two what are these two warnings? Unexpected exception. I don't know if it is. You close out scene builder. Oh, it doesn't match. Okay, I forgot. I need to update that. So my FXML here.
Let's run this field. Yep, should be fine. Oh, friends. Okay. Let's open that up. We broke it somehow. What doesn't it like? Come on, friends. A list you on a label, yeah. We give it Maggie. Oh, what happened to my, my event handler? On um, oh, drag drop. Oh, that was a mouse. Yeah, I have the mouse event handler. Nothing. Uh Event handler is not in the namespace where there's an error in the script. Update receipt. Isn't it called update receipt? Update receipt, yeah. Oops. Edit. Put update receipt, yeah. Update receipt. It's all there. Need controls controller. Super confused, folks. I'm sorry. I don't know what we did to break it. Take out the list view and the label. Let's update the controller. So we don't want this here then. Let's get rid of that. Maybe it's our list view that broke it. Nope. <laughs> oh, how do we break it so bad? Run action, update receipt. That was working. We didn't even change the update receipt. Um, I'm upset, folks. I'm upset. All right, let's uh, clean the build one more time. The curse of the front end technologies. <laughs> Yeah, it says it builds successfully. That's a good sign. So it should, 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 should run. Patient start. Patient start method. Oh, goodness. My pound signs got taken out. That's what it is. Those pound signs are missing. How did that even happen? You know, I think I clicked update in my scene builder. And I think it didn't have that update. There's another one. Oh, no. Pound sign. Pound sign. Update receipt. All of you update receipt. Make sure these all have the right handlers here. Update receipt. Update receipt. Update receipt. All right. All right. Maybe now it'll run. All right. It was not the list view. It was me being dumb. Let's go back to our list view. Yeah. All right. 
Take the list view. Throw that in there. Call this our copy list view. Take a label. Throw that in there. Call that one the list view label. All right. Now, make controller. Oh, we still don't have the method. That's right. Add a handler on mouse pressed. Let's uh, copy list view clicked. Make controller. All right. Make sure it runs. I, I need to do this step by step by step. This is what I get for one two soon. Okay, good. That works. Now let's see if we can update our copy list view label. Let this say type of string again. See if we can run that. Uh oh. Uh oh. Type copy list. Copy with one e. I should not misspell copy. That's sad. Come on, Eric. My English is that bad. But now I have a cool little list view, right? And I can drag and drop, or you know, scroll automatically. Let's add a couple more options here then. Americano, how about a flat white? Now, what else do you, you folks like for your coffee? Uh, cappuccino? I can't even spell cappuccino. Cappuccino. I, oh my goodness, it's so, so off. Cappuccino? Please, please tell me you know what I'm typing. There we go. C A P P. C A P P U. C-C-I-N-O. Exactly how it sounds. Cappuccino. I'm just terrible at English. No! Copy cappuccino. Cappuccino. Terrible at English. And so we're going to add the items. And then in the list view, you can select items. Right? Or you can... Oh, no. It's only give me... Where's my multi-select? I think I set the property wrong on it. Properties... Where's the multi-select? Oh, goodness. Yes, yeah, the select mode. Where's my select mode? Oh goodness, I don't see it. Layout? It's not a layout. No? Well, we can set it in code. That's okay. So we can set our copy list view. We can set selection mode. Mode. No, not model. Set selection mode. Oh, goodness. Oh, I'm sorry. We have to get the selection mode. Get the selection model dot set selection mode given a single or multi select. Ugh, so gross. Right, then we can have our event handling. So when, when the mouse is clicked, what do we want to do? Well, we need to get all the items that were selected. Right, so we're going to take my copy list view. Copy list view. I'm going to get the selection model, and then we want to get selected items here. So that selected items is going to get me a list of strings. So I can say, I don't know, um, how about we'll do a little loop. So we'll say for 
string item in that collection. Let's take our label. Uh, that's our list view label. And we'll set the text to the list view label that get text plus the item plus uh, you know yeah, how about a space maybe add some faces there so let's get the text add the item add a space so here's black coffee it's cold brew it's espresso cold brew Full brew. Uh-oh. It's shrinking me out here. So I need to get... I should blank it first. Right? So set the set text to nothing first. There we go. So start with nothing, and then we'll start adding our thing. So black coffee, cold brew, sure. I can do one at a time. I can multi-select now right, with a control click, or I can, you know, shift click to grab a couple. Look at that. All right, so maybe we want to... Uh, going individual lines might not work great. Um, hmm. Not going to be the prettiest, but we can see what's selected. Right? Sort of go through there. Sorry, my little guy fell asleep on the walk. Yeah, give me one second. I gotta go grab him here. So he fell asleep. I'll be right back. Look at that. I even turned the music off. I turned the music back on. Be right back, folks. Sorry. In like three minutes. I'll be right there.
All right, folks, sorry about that. I'm back here. All right, he's he's cranky when he moves. He's a big guy. All right, so we, anyway, we got our list. We can play with our, our list here. So these ones are really fun. Um, you can, you know, they don't even need to be multi-select. They'd be single-select. But the other thing you can do is with this um, getting the collection here, you have a lot of ability to... Um, you, you can hook it up to a observable list. And an observable list is going to link it up so that as things are added and subtracted from the list, they are automatically updated in the UI. So there's some pretty cool things you can do. Um, and it's we're not doing too much of it in here. Um, maybe that might be nice with our, our receipt. Um, but using the this observable idea is that when a collection changes we want to go notice that it changed and do something about it that's that observable idea so an observable collection then will tell whoever's observing it that it's been changed and it can go and update itself so we could add the ability to kind of link this up here so we can add a new um, a private um, array list list of type string uh, we'll just call this items, I guess. Excuse me. Yeah! Ooh, sorry about that. I didn't get the mutant time. Ugh. So instead of setting it here, we're going to um, hook up its items. We're going to link that observable list with it. All right, so where are we doing that? So then I'll say, hey, my items dot add all. And we'll add all of these items here. Oh, goodness. New string array. Right. Is that to here uh, as as list? There we go. No, nope. as list. Thank you. Ugh. It's way too obnoxious to do that, but sure, we can add a bunch of items now. So we'll set that up as an array list, right? given an array, because I already had an array, they want to have to add them one at a time. Right? And then we can make our list view watch this array. We take our coffee list view, we want it um, observable. Get oh goodness, I lost it already. Get items. There we go. Right, that's our items. Let me give us set items, do we? Ah, yes. There we go. We can set the items here. Two, and now we need to make a new observable list from our array list. So we have an observable list of type string here. This will be my um, observable list. Is now there's an FX collections class you can use. Dot observable array list given my items. Goodness. Then we can give that observable list to the coffee list view. And then we need a way to add more items. So we can add items then to that. So let's go back to our user interface here. And let's go add in maybe a text box. Um, nope. 
text field. There we go. So we'll add a text field here. And then we'll call this the new item text field. And a button for add new item. All right, and then we'll come back and we'll make our controller. So when we add a new item, we want to say if the new item text field get text does not equal nothing, right? Or if it's not is empty, wait, is it a string dot? String dot. No, okay. It's just if it's not uh, dot equals if it does not equal that, right? If it's not empty, then we can go and do it. Actually, maybe we should dot trim it too. Dot trim. So in case there's any extra spaces. If it's not there, then I can go take my list here, my items, and I want to add whatever that is in here. Let's give that a shot. We should be able to add new items to our menu. Oh, I broke it again. I broke it. <laughs> Friends, it's just not going today. Oops, this item is null. Oops, uh, oops, 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 oops. Um, so, items equals a new array list of type string, or just diamond. Now I can actually do something with my items. All right, you'll see I've got all my items here on my list. Let's see if I can add, um, uh, what is it, just a regular latte, latte. Oh, I didn't add. Oh, uh, did I not hook it up right? It's not adding. You know, I don't think, you know, I don't even need that as... I want this one here. So we can add right to the observable list. That's what we want to do. There we go. So I just made it out of an array list. Can I just made it out of text collections dot observable array list. I don't know if I would have taken this one or not. It does, yay. Okay, we can skip a step. All right, it just takes a regular list here. There we go. That's a little prettier. Let's see if we can add some items. So let's add the latte. Now I have latte in my list. Because I don't need to tell it to go update the list view itself. What I'm updating is um, an observable list here. So I don't need to go through the list view every single time. I can have just the data object here, or the data attribute, just that list of strings here, a list of whatever I want, right? I might have a bunch of receipt items or something I could have. And as long as it's observable, then the UI can be set to just watch it. So if I add something to the observable list, I didn't tell it, hey, go update any of these set visible or set items or anything like that. We just set the item collection to the observable list. So you'll see this pattern a lot in Java FX where you're going to set something that's observable and then if that thing changes, it's going to go updated automatically for us. So we don't have to do all these updates um, from scratch every time. And there's nothing really wrong with that approach, but it's nicer when it, the tool does it for you. It's kind of the idea with that. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, combo boxes are pretty similar, but it's like a drop down. Um, does a similar thing. And then sliders are a lot of fun for numeric values. You can set sliders. So let's go add some sliders here. 
You can find a slider. So you can have horizontal or vertical sliders. Right? We can put them in really any order we want here. Um, just throw a slider in, in here, I guess. And we'll throw another label in here. This is our slider. And here's the slider label. So then the slider properties have what's my min, what's my max? What are my my current value and how many increments I'm going to have? I like having tick marks here. And I like tick labels. And you can change the major tick unit if you want. You can change, you know, the minor tick counts. Um, you can snap to ticks. So it'll be, we'll only uh, let you release at ticks or we'll, you know, kind of find the nearest tick. Or you can let it be free. Either one's fine. Uh, so we need a code here. We want a on, which one do we want here? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we don't want the drag drops. Keyboards, we don't want that. We want mouse. So how about it on scroll? It might be on scroll. Update slider label. And right, then we'll go back and we'll make our controller again. So we're going to take the slider label and we're going to set the text to the slider dot get value. And get value is a double. So we need um, double dot two string. Slider get value. So when we update the slider label. It didn't set the text. Slider label. Set text. I must have the wrong event there. Hang on a second. What is the event we need for sliders? The value. Yeah. Come back to our slider. Did uh, I type it in there? I didn't, right? On scroll. Ah, no, I want that on mouse moved. There we go. That's a mouse event, not a scroll event. So just the event here is different. Let's try that one. There we go. We can see now I, when I drag it, though, it's not updating as I drag it. Right? So it's only showing me when I let go. And that's the problem with this mouse event. So it's not really doing what we want. Right, what we really want it to do is, as it's changing, we want it to, to hook it up. So instead of doing it this way, right, we're actually going to abandon this um, update slider label. We don't need this particular event listener. What we need to do is we're going to go to our slider, and we don't need that one either. Uh, actually, I want that line. That's all we need. So when we initialize, you know, we're going to do this observable thing. So we're going to go to my slider. It has a value property. And what you can do is you can add a listener. So what we want to do when we add this listener is we want to say, okay, What's going to happen when this changes? Now, there's some cool things you can do. If we only ever want to set this up once and we're never going to use the same method again, we can make this anonymous method. We kind of skipped over it a little bit at the end of last chapter. Um, it's essentially a method defined in line here. So I can say, hey, here's an observable. Nope, observable. 
thing. Here's an old value. Here's a new value. And then I'm going to take those and use this arrow notation. This is called a lambda. Here, we use this arrow. And well, what do we want to do? What I want to do this anonymous method. So it says, hey, given these three things, do this code. So it's essentially building a method with these variables right inside of this listener. So you can do it this approach if you want. And we're going to take that slider label. We'll set the text to the value. And actually, we don't even need to get the value here. We can do the new value argument. No, nope, it's not even a new value to string. There we go. We can just take that one to string. Give that a little format. Let's see if this will run for us now. Oh, I don't want observable list. I just want observable. It's fine. Run it one more time. These are only their local variables to this anonymous method we just built. So now when I do my slider, as it's dragging, right, it's updating this. So this function is getting called every time it changes values. So when the value property changes, we've added a listener. So this is the, the more how you would do listeners by hand. And so they're a little bit obnoxious. So when we added a listener, that was, what type was that? Uh, I'm going to go back to that add again. Dot. Add listener. It's a change listener. So we could have a public void. Um, oh, no, it's, it's a whole other class. So you could do an anonymous inner class. Oh, those are obnoxious. This is why I don't like doing these um, with listener code. But you could add a new class then with a method. Oh, yeah, those are no fun. Sorry, that's how you used to have to do all your event handling code. Yeah, that's no fun. We'll, we'll just stick with the Lambda because that will make life easier for us. Okay, so sliders are really cool. So we can use that to say, hey, when that happens, do this thing. Uh, text areas, yeah, you can have text areas. That you can do menus. Menus are really fun. Um, and the file chooser is great. Uh, it's like you got a built-in. It'll let you browse around and find a file. So you can do... Um, check to see if you've selected a file or you can give them, you know, what do they want to call a file for doing a lot of saving back and forth. So the um, file UI is really cool. All right, I've got eight. We've gone through a lot and we got most of chapter 13 out of the way here. Uh, again, you can you can take a look at some of those other options if you want. Um, looking at, you know, just cleaner ways of doing things. You can add your own menu to the UI here if you want. That I believe is our, our control. Yeah, you can add like a menu bar here and with whatever menu options you want in here you got some pizza professor i'm jealous i pizza is definitely a weakness of mine and we can add items to the menu bar you got lots of cool options with menu bars but we're not going to do anything with those look at that you got some cool options all right folks so we'll, we'll call it a night uh, again Play around with some of these um, controls. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at a lot of these from 1500. Um, I don't think you went into these um, listeners or collectible observable things in 1500. If you did, I'd be really surprised. Um, and maybe you did. I'll just be pleasantly surprised. But this is a fun way that we can hook things up and make life a little easier for us. To say, hey, I'm just going to watch when this one changes. Okay. Well, what is it upset about? What's not a statement? Okay, it's confused. I just had hit save. Yeah, I, Professor, I know. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. So that's that's. I don't have much more than sorry, unfortunately. Um, and we don't need that. Our mouse event. Go? Oh, we do need the mouse event for the coffee view. Cool. All right. So take a little time. Check some of these out. Play with them. Start thinking about your design for Yahtzee if you haven't yet. Um, again, the goal is all of you complete it and have something that you're proud of. So I'm here to help get you unstuck anytime you guys get stuck on something. I'm 
you know, I'm not going to write the code for you, but I'll, I'll help you get pointed in the right direction um, anytime that happens. So again, generally the rule of thumb is you'd spend a good maybe hour on it, um, trying to trying to figure it out yourself, um, looking at some of these resources, looking at some of the things we've done. Um, if you've spent at least an hour on it and you still don't know what to do, let me know. I'm happy to jump in and help. But if you spend more than an hour and you haven't made any progress, you're just going to start getting frustrated at me, frustrated at the project, frustrated at yourself, and we just don't want any of that frustration. It doesn't make anything better. Um, so, you know, try, try and, and, you know, use your resources, look look at some, some examples and go from there. But um, if you do get stuck, please don't wait all day. I've had people be like, I've been working on this for 12 hours today, and then I look at it and we fix it in five minutes. And while it's nice that we can fix it, it's, you know, that, that's a really crappy 12 hours. And then you're in a bad mood and I'm just feeling bad. So uh, we want to avoid that if we can help it. Okay. And uh, don't forget we have study group coming up this week. Again, you are welcome to discuss ideas in study group about the final project. Right. Any sort of discussions are perfectly fine. But if you find yourself like taking notes and writing down like, okay, this is exactly what, you know, what this method is and that sort of thing, we've gone a little too far with that discussion uh, but talking about classes you might have talking about methods that's all great you know this is how i might lay out lay out my ui i might use buttons i might use this i might do that that's all great uh, i'm happy to see that sort of thing all right so we got study group coming up on thursday five o'clock uh, be there or be square that's that's probably not a thing people say anymore is it i say a lot of weird things so all right uh, why don't we go find somebody else out in the world to bother here and we'll send a raid out and see what's up. It has been fun. Let me know how I can help. Again, I, I want you to be successful. I want you to present something you're proud of when we meet on Zoom and we get together. And we'll go from there. Let me know what I can do to help. All right, folks, who's around? Uh, we've got uh, Boyd is working with resin. We got Owen doing some wood crafting. He's doing some pendants. Um, Rob's on doing some more code. Uh, yeah, a couple of people can hang out. Uh, Psych Queen is talking about psychology things. If you want to improve your, your soft skills, we can head over there. Definitely very interesting stuff, but I was never good at psychology and understanding people. Or the StarCraft 2. All right, we'll just send one over somewhere. We'll have some fun. We'll go check out Site Queen. We're doing some interesting stuff. All right, folks, you take care. I'll see you around and let me know what I can do to help. Thanks, everybody.